Hi students, this is Dr. Nurse. I'm in the lab. One of the main things with our technique week that, that became apparent was that people didn't really understand recrystallization. So it would be really good if you went back and reviewed recrystallization theory. Okay, the basic idea is you have a crude solid. The solid might be contaminated with starting materials or other byproducts of the reaction. Recrystallization is still considered to be an easy, fast way to purify a solid. The basic idea is you put it into a solvent that it's a little bit mismatched with. That, that means it's a little bit, its polarity is a little off, such that the compound is not very soluble in the compound when it's cold, and it's really insoluble, it's quite soluble when it's hot, and it's insoluble when it's cool. Okay? What you were asked to do last week was to take a small sample, and, and by the way, and through that process, you want to leave the contaminants behind. So hopefully the contaminant would never go into solution or it would remain in the mother liquor of the solution. But we got the impression when people were doing this that they didn't really understand it. Okay, so I think you need to review that. So this would be a typical sample that a student had last week, very similar. It's actually the exo product from the reaction of furan with um, malic and hydride. And I, the uh, undergraduate section will kind of review this a little bit. This is exactly a half a gram. One of the things I want to emphasize is the size of the glassware. If you're working with around a half a gram to a gram, you would want to be using a 25 milliliter Erlenmeyer. Notice I'm using an Erler, Erlenmeyer and not a beaker. And I say this all year, but people don't listen to me. I am very anti-beakers. And anyone who used a beaker, you saw what happened. Okay, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. All right. Now, the idea here was that you were going to use a two-solvent system. You were going to use a combination of ethanol and water. And this was a little risky because the compound is an anhydride, and as you'll learn in your lecture course, anhydrides react with water. So you had to do this in the right sequence. They react with hot water. So had you added the water first and boiled it, you would have destroyed the anhydride. The idea when working with two solvent systems, is your two solvents in a system, is that you're trying to create that little mismatch with regard to polarity by using the two together. Typically what you do is you get the compound to go into the solvent it's more soluble in when it's hot, the one it's more soluble in by heating, and get it. And it's very easy to get it in solution. Okay, once you get it in solution, then you might use the water to change the polarity of the solution, to, in other words, to make it a little bit more polar, and by making it a little more, more polar, the desired molecules will be less soluble, but ho hopefully the contaminants will remain behind. And I think you really have to think about that theory again. Now again, typically one solvent will do it. But a lot of times you can't do it with one solvent. So what I'm going to do here is heat up some, some ethanol. Let's see how long that takes. My heater here was going a little while before. Okay, so now I'm heating the ethanol. I probably should have been heating it when I was explaining it to you. What I have here is some water that I'm going to use to um, get this the sample out of solution. Now notice in both my reservoir, that's my reservoir of ethanol. This hot plate, by the way, is quite hot. One of the things I'll tell you about ethanol is ethanol boils at 77 degrees. You don't need that much heat to get it boiling. Okay, you don't have to go up to high to get it boiling. You just want to get it boiling or near boiling. It's almost there already. Okay, the other thing is you have to put boiling stones. Now I actually put three in here. I only need one. Remember, a boiling stone is a piece of carbon normally that is filled with air with, with many channels. And the channels are filled with air pockets. And when it heats, the air, po the, the air is released and the air creates and establishes an equilibrium with the vapor coming out of the liquid. And the vapor is able to travel into these bubbles and more easily travel out of the solution rather than bumping. All right, now this solution's hot now. It's boiling. I don't want to keep, I'm, I'm going to keep it nice and nice and just at the boiling point. I can tell it's boiling because I see boiling coming off my boiling stones. Can you see that on the thing? I don't want to leave it on too long because it might pop. Okay? Now remember, ethanol is flammable, so you have to be careful with it. I find if I just heat it up, I can handle it. If you can't handle it, you can use some kind of a rubber grip like this or a little piece of paper toweling or something like that. What I'm going to do is add a little tiny bit of this very hot solvent to my half a gram of the crude material. You have to be very conservative with you when you do this. And the, the other thing we noticed is people were really putting a lot of solvent in. I mean, tons of solvent. Okay, you know, some people had 50, 60, you know, like tons of solvent in there. 
Now if you want, you can heat it a little bit, but don't go overboard. This is just ethanol, okay? Notice I only added, I added about five mils. You, you, some people got away with as little or two or three, and I saw one woman completely recrystallize a sample without even using water because she had put the right amount of solvent in. I want you to think about what happens if you put too much solvent in, okay? Now again, watch how long this is taking me. I hope it doesn't take too long. Maybe I'll be here for hours, I don't know. I'm going to heat up my reservoir again. I don't want to overheat this one. And again, a, a really good um, kind of skilled chemist doesn't really need to do what I'm doing here. Whoop, there, I'm bumping again. Okay, so I'm going to take this off. You want to avoid any sort of bumping. Now that's boiling. As soon as it comes to boiling, I take it off. What I want to do is examine it, okay? Look at that. One of the questions I got repeatedly was whether or not it was in solution. And people kept asking me, what does it mean to be in solution? And I kept, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a shake there. But I kept saying, what does it mean to be in solution? And what it means to be, and some people would say, there's no particulate matter, okay? The solution should be clear. There should be none of the original compound. And the only thing I should see are my three boiling stones. And I really shouldn't have used three boiling stones. You will notice that I have completely gotten the solution in with maybe five or less milliliters of ethanol, and I didn't even measure it. Okay, so I am done. Okay, the, the job is done. Now, here's the deal. Everybody's in a big rush to grow crystals. But the truth is, it's not good to grow crystals quickly. You need to grow crystals very slowly. And one of the things we know is that fast crystal growth causes several problems. One problem is the crystals tend to be very small. In other words, if you do anything to shock that solution, such as scratching it, moving it around, plunging it in ice, I wouldn't put it in ice. There's no reason for you to put a well-recrystallized sample into ice. Okay, maybe I'll get no crystal here. I don't know. I may have to leave it overnight. I don't know. I don't want to be too optimistic. However, <laughs> I may not succeed here, right? I'm doing this on the fly. But the thing is, um, I wouldn't put it in ice, I wouldn't scratch it, and I wouldn't start diluting it more unless I had to, okay? So I'm just going to let it sit for a minute. Maybe the crystals will grow right out of this ethanol, and that's all the better. Okay, that's all the better. But again, fast recrystallization. When you, when you shock it in any way by scratching it, dumping it in ice, shaking it around, whatever you're doing, evaporating off the solvent really rapidly, throwing water in there, when you do that, you tend to get many nucleation sites. When you get many nucleation sites, they are small. When they are small, they tend to have a, to a very large total surface area. And think about this. The, you're, if you have a bigger surface area of solid, you're going to have more contaminant sticking to that surface area. Okay? On the other hand, okay, crystals that grow slowly, am I okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be done in a minute. Crystals that grow slowly, okay, they equilibrate. Now what that means is the crystal is this very regular structure that's forming, where the molecules fit in like lock and key kind of. And it's a really beautiful example of molecular communication. So when the right molecule comes in and fits properly, the energy's lower and it'll stay in there. But if it's the wrong molecule, it'll tend to spit it out and eventually the right molecule will come in. Now again, this takes time and equilibration. That's why we, why we like slow crystallizations, okay? We don't want a crystallization that takes two seconds. You want it because you want to get out of lab. But if you do it slower, you're going to get better material. Now, again, I saw a student only recrystallize the material with ethanol. I'm going to see if I was able to do that here. Maybe not, but I think it's happening. Um, I don't know if you can see that there. Okay. If you look at this, you can see I am growing crystals. Do you see that? I did not add water. I did not add, I did not boil it down to nothing. I did not do anything wild to this. I did not even have to scratch it. All I did is what you're supposed to do in a recrystallization, which is add the minimum amount of the solvent. Now in this case, Ethanol itself, do you see the crystals? Can you see them in the film? Mm -hmm. um, and you can see they're growing as I speak. I think if I ran this film on fast speed, you would actually see the crystals growing. And you might see, I shouldn't even be shaking here, moving it around, because that's not good. So all I would do with this, really, is just let it sit and let the crystals grow, and then I would vacuum them out. Now, why am I so anti-beaker? Did you see how easy that was? 
What would have happened if I were boiling in a beaker? I want you to really think about this. And I saw this time and time again, and I could show it to you here if I had time, but I don't have time. Do you, again, do you see how easy that recrystallization was? It was so easy. Okay, so think about the things you did, but the beaker, if I did that in a beaker, there would have been solids stuck to the walls. And because you wouldn't get a good reflux going, and you don't have slanted walls, any compound that's up on the walls will stay on the walls and it'll stay crude. You want it to come down in the solution, become part of the solution completely, and then crystallize very slowly, leaving the contaminant behind. Now, had this not come out of solution the way it did so beautifully, and the reason it did was because I added the minimum amount of solvent. If it had not, I might have added a couple drops of water, and I'm going to do that now to show you what that does. All right, drop, let's do it in front of the camera. I don't know if you can see that, can you see that? Drop, drop, and it's not really doing much. Okay, now, ordinarily when you add a drop of water, it gets a little more polar. When it gets a little more polar, you see a little more solid come out. But honestly, for this particular crystallization, I don't think you really needed it. And you wouldn't, you don't have to dump an equal volume of water. You just kind of drop it in until it stops crystallizing. Now students asked me, they said, well, how much water do I put in? Or how do I know when I'm done? The way you know you're done is you really just let it sit for about 10 minutes. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, it should have equilibrated at room temperature, no ice. I don't want to see ice baths anymore. I don't want to see ice baths. I don't want to see huge volumes of solvent. And honest to God, I don't want to see beakers ever again. I'm not kidding. I don't know how, why I can't get this idea across. And I hope everyone watches that video. That was easy. It took me three minutes to set it up, and I believe it took me about, we can time it on the thing, I think it took five to 10 minutes to do the recrystallization. Another thing, when you're vacuum filtering the crystal out, and there's plenty of crystal in there, when you vacuum filter the crystal out, the filter paper should lay flat in the adapter. Now for this quantity, I might even go this small. In other words, I might use a vacuum, this is something else I'm doing, but I might use a vacuum filter apparatus like that, might, or the medium size. And remember, the filter paper should lay flat. It shouldn't be lapping up around the side. So that's, that's the end of that. And really, this is an important video because I think this is a serious problem we have in the lab.